And here we are. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Zoom and Facebook Live webinar. I invite you to remain until the end, as we will have time for questions and answers with our special guests this evening. Um, and we will also be announcing how you can get a copy of the content tonight. So though it is being recorded, um, unfortunately, we won't be uh, distributing that information um, out to everyone. So everyone, my name is Mark Coronel. I'm a property coach and sales director of Cube Corp. Um, and with COVID-19 hitting our flight decks in March 2020, much of the media has been berated our public with generally negative news. Now, this is a tune that we're quite familiar with right now, with in the past 12 to 18 months, hearing headlines like house prices dropping 20, 30 percent, Sydney experiencing all-time vacancy lows for over the last 50 years. Now, let's not forget the consistent reminder that how many cases we're contracting of COVID-19 on a daily basis. And indeed, we are all going through tough times with many experiencing unemployment or job cuts. But Australia, we will get through it together. And I do wish all of you and your loved ones at home both safety during this lockdown. Okay, but amongst all the doom and gloom, there are some positive things. There are some headlines like brokers continuing to smash records, according to the MFAA, home loans spiking by over 248 percent, an all time high over the last 20 years, according to the Real Estate Institute of Australia. Now, this is all well and good. But for those looking to enter the market, uh, disparity, uncertainty continues to misguide and hold up these opportunities to purchase especially where some markets have actually thrived during lockdown. And I'm sure that's what a lot of you are here to find out, where these COVID hotspots, uh, where property prices and markets have actually thrived. So tonight, without further ado, we will be having the opportunity to have the, the fog lifted and have a clear picture of what is actually happening with Australia's property market. Because we are privileged to have with us, once again, Australia's leading independent property market specialist, Dr. Andrew Wilson. So welcome, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. And uh, it's great to be here again. And uh, one of my favourite topics is uh, speaking about the Canberra housing market. I mean, does it get any easier than that? Well, you know, you know what I'm saying, but it's certainly a, a very positive market. And uh, I do speak about the Canberra market quite frequently, but we are really across the board in a, a particularly strong environment for housing markets. We just keep pushing that pause button, you know, and uh, it's just like putting the dam over the river. It just builds up and builds up and builds up behind the dam. And then we release the dam and guess what? You know, it's a flood. Um, and we've <laughs> seen that really over the last uh, 18 months as we've come out of lockdown. And I think the really interesting um, scenario here is, and I'm saying this with a, with a bit of uh, a grain of salt, is that this will be our last lockdown, um, that we are moving away from the elimination policy, which is all about lockdowns, uh, and moving into the uh, control environment where we live with the virus. And, and that means that those dams that have been put across our property market uh, as a result of uh, COVID lockdowns and other factors over the last few years uh, won't be there. And we can finally reach, um, I guess, that orderly housing market that we've been uh, trying to find really since 2015. And um, so we've got something to look forward to. But with all things, human nature is a, a, a remarkably adaptable uh, function and uh, we are adapting to lockdown. We've had it all before. It's not good and we hate it, uh, mm. but we learn to get on with life and that's what we've been doing in our property markets. Um, it's quite not remarkable, but certainly encouraging that we are still seeing transactions. Um, probably the market that's most underperforming is the one that's got the, the strictest um, barriers to transactions, and that's the Melbourne market. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't inspect a property in Melbourne, whereas in Sydney, you can under strict uh, controlled mechanisms. And, and that means that, you know, it gives the opportunity for, uh, for buyers and sellers to do their thing. But of course, the numbers are down, um, but uh, it's still turning over. And it is all about now waiting to catch up with those lost opportunities for lockdown. 
But as I said, the point is now that this is be the last of that big dam across, hopefully that big dam across our housing market uh, river. And mm -hmm. um, once that's released, we'll be able to get, uh, after some growth, obviously, we'll be able to uh, find finally that, that uh, normal, um, you know, cycle, flatter cycle. Um, so that's my introduction, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely. And look, fingers <laughs> crossed. I, I hope I'm everything... Stop there. <laughs> You know what's good about that and why we continue to ask you, not just because, you know, you're definitely a headliner, um, you're definitely a, a charming fellow and one that speaks to the people, but some of the stuff that you've actually said to us in the past where a lot of um, critics, uh, other critics and, uh, and other economists um, in Australia, um, even some with their jobs still right now. Uh, yeah. We're all against some of the predictions that you mentioned, and this is why we look to you for some of the information, uh, well, most of the information regards with what's trending, what's happening actually with the market. And um, yeah, it definitely helps us to guide our clients um, with growing their portfolios. Well, we've got a, a particularly a, a Canberra focus tonight, as I mentioned, Mark. Uh, I was a little disturbed when you said some of the things I said were right, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass just at the moment. I, you know, I know you're trying to be uh, you keep it politically under, correct. Under, yeah, <laughs> under, that's good, mate. But uh, just about all the things I say are right. But um, uh, yeah, we will obviously speak about the big picture. Um, we're a little bit constrained for time in the sense that uh, it would be a good opportunity to get some questions through at the end of the presentation. I think that's always important. So if you like, I can start off if you yes, have nothing more to say and uh, I can take control and share the screen and do all those wonderful Zoom things we're all so used to doing. Ready ready to go. Just let me know when we're... Just while that's loading, um, we do have an audience that's with us tonight. So we're 67 strong at the moment. Um, guys, I would like to point out a special guest as well. I did mention to uh, Dr. Wilson that we are mentioned... Uh, that when he did mention Canberra, we do have the privilege and it is remiss of me if I don't point out, but we have a special guest member today as well. He's in the audience, uh, a Geocon director and local legend, Mr. Simon Chester. So uh, welcome, Mr. Simon. Is that is that working, Dr. No, Wilson? I haven't, I'm frozen here. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Maybe um, that, try, uh, I'll, oh, there we go, perfect. I'll get back to uh, the beginning. Yeah, I noticed Simon there. Good day, Simon. Um, always good to see Simon uh, in the audience, and uh, I'm sure he's got some things to say regarding, particularly his um, his projects. Now, yeah, no, thanks, screen okay? Thanks, Andrew. Looking forward to it as as always. And uh, Echo Marks, um, just go one further and say a thousand percent of what you say is correct. Not most things. Everything. <laughs> That's fine. That's very good. But uh, always, I always. Uh, embrace a very positive relationship with uh, with Geocon and um, there's no surprise it's such a significant force particularly in, in Canberra property so uh, good on you mate and uh, uh, I hope you're uh, enjoying yourself in the Canberra lockdown I'm saying that with tongue-in-cheek very much so but uh, we're all in the same boat so what can you do all right shall I uh, commence there Mark you can hear me okay perfect all right well we'll start off and Look, that's my brand, my housing market. I, uh, I act as an independent consultant uh, um, uh, regarding housing market analysis. Um, uh, and my focus really is, as, as it says there in the tag, uh, about understanding the current state and future prospects of your housing market. Um, I, as I said, I act as an independent um, analyst for a number of clients and uh, I, uh, I'm just paid a fee for my participation here. My passion is all about science and uh, analysis uh, and economics, and that's all part of uh, obviously focusing on the housing market. I don't get any commission, um, and I know that uh, obviously um, there is a, a, a focus on product tonight, and, and that's all about understanding from um, Simon and Mark uh, what exactly their product are. But I'm about the housing market, and, and, uh, and certainly providing insights to those that are wanting to understand the, the current dynamics and the future prospect of the housing market. And that's me, I've got a few qualifications. So I suppose if you're regarded as an expert, and thank you very much for that, um, you need to have some paper behind you. So I have got some pieces of paper behind me, I have done the hard yards in terms of study. 
And also, I think it's important to have qualifications in the particular area that, uh, that you're undertaking your analysis. And uh, all, my, uh, all my qualifications are in housing market economics and economics. Uh, I'm also a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, which means that I have a, uh, a particular expertise in measurement. And of course, my measurement is measuring um, economic cycles and the housing market. Uh, also, I've had a, uh, a career as a, a formal career as a property economist uh, over a number of years, probably getting too many to, to uh, re reveal, but uh, my previous uh, formal uh, role was as chief economist for the domain group. And as I said uh, at the introduction, I'm, uh, my business is my, called My Housing Market and uh, my role there is, is as the chief economist. I also still get my, uh, my head on the TV occasionally. In fact, more than occasionally recently, I've had a, uh, we've had a number of uh, um, uh, programs, a number of reports through Channel 9 Sydney. Um, our latest one was last Saturday where we previewed the spring selling season. I should have said to everybody, happy spring. We are into spring now, the spring selling season and the spring buying season. Let's not forget that. And we started off quite well, really across the board. And we'll look at the latest results at the end of the presentation. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think I'm regarded as, uh, in some sense, a straight shooter in terms of the housing market. Um, I'm not um, tempted to use those extreme you know, clickbait types of tags, house price crash, you know, boom, bust, those sort of scenarios. And, uh, uh, and that's, I guess, reflects my, um, my background in formal research as well as, uh, as uh, those formal employment roles. And we're going to talk about Canberra tonight. Uh, the Canberra, Canberra is booming. And I guess it's no uh, surprise that Canberra is booming because everybody else is booming. But we can see really that the Canberra market, when we look at the data, is, is really head and shoulders to some degree in terms of having the, I guess, the, uh, the leading indicators of, uh, of activity across the board compared to other capital city markets. And um, really, I've been presenting um, on various capital city markets, of course, but I've been presenting on the Canberra market for a number of years now. And I'm, I'm always bemused to some degree that... Uh, regardless of promoting how strong that market is over, over quite a lengthy period of time, uh, you always feel it's uh, a bit too good to be true, but uh, actually it really is true. Uh, and we're going to look at that today, but certainly Canberra has top investor opportunities. And we're, we're seeing that uh, with growing demand, particularly from prospective Sydney investors for product in the Canberra market. And uh, the numbers in terms of growth, particularly in, in investor lending into the Canberra market, are growing quite strongly, as they are really in most capital city markets. And, and that's because finally investors uh, are back in town after a very quiet period, uh, which did reflect a, um, a significant credit squeeze that was placed on investors um, over the past five years. But banks are happy to, less, to lend again to investors now. And investors really do want to get more of the action, considering just how strong these markets have been over, all our capital city markets have been over the last 12 to 18 months, but some of them stand out compared to others. And Canberra is one of those standouts. We're going to have a look at that um, when we can get the... Got a frozen screen here. Are you there, Mark? There we go. So we're back in town. Um, pardon me for that, that pause. I'm going to put this down here. So there we go. So we're going to start. All right, I think we're back in town now. Yeah, we are. Um, so we're going to start with interest rates. And interest rates, when we're talking property, are always the first uh, port of call. 
Uh, today, the RBA met for the uh, for the September uh, interest rate meeting, and um, no surprise, of course, they left interest rates on hold at that very low 0.1 of a percent where it has been for um, for quite some time now, and really no prospect of it moving from that, particularly given that um, we are in the middle of a lockdown and we will start to see some economic consequences uh, as a response to that lockdown. But the Reserve Bank today uh, predictably kept interest rates on hold at that 0.1 of a percent. Um, if we can perhaps look a little deeper into that interest rate decision, um, the Reserve Bank also, uh, also uh, reported that it's, um, uh, it's purchasing program for government bonds, which it had uh, announced prior to the current lockdown that it was going to start tapering, that is, it was going to purchase less, uh, fewer government bonds, uh, which is a stimulus to the economy, of course, over the next few months. There was an expectation given, um, given COVID that it would uh, halt that tapering of bond purchases. Uh, and it would actually uh, either keep it at the level it was or increase it. But the Reserve Bank announced today that it's going to continue with its tapering. So it is quite confident about the outlook for the economy. Uh, it believes the stimulus that it's doing at the moment and the tapering uh, will not affect the economy, uh, that, that it's good enough for the economy and the tapering won't uh, affect it. Uh, but what it said, it's going to extend the bond purchasing process out into February. So some good news there in terms of the attitude of the Reserve Bank towards, um, towards the economy, even in, uh, even in our luck, luck, uh, lockdown environment. But that's our interest rate cycle. It's a roller coaster, as you can see, or it was a roller coaster. Uh, we go back to way back to 2008. You can see we had interest rates there. These are mortgage rates, uh, way up at nearly 10%. I'm not sure we'd like to be paying 10% for our mortgage now. But of course, we had a very strong economy there. The Reserve Bank was trying very hard to take the heat out of the economy putting up interest rates so we would spend less because we'd have to be paying more for our mortgage. Businesses would be investing less because they'd be paying more for their overdrafts. Um, it started to work, but then along came the GFC, which was a global financial crisis, um, a significant uh, a global downturn, economic downturn, and the Reserve Bank hurriedly moved into reverse gear, cutting interest rates to try to stimulate the economy. Um, we, however, in Australia, were lucky because we had China come to our assistance uh, after the GFC with mining boom number two. We had another big economic growth phase. Uh, Reserve Bank pushed up interest rates again just to take some heat out of the economy. Always concerned about higher inflation. But uh, once that mining boom ended, we joined the rest of the world going down and down finding out that lower interest rates were not particularly giving us the inflation and the incomes growth that they had, uh, that lower interest rates had done traditionally in the past. Um, so uh, uh, again, it was something that uh, the rest of the world had learned through that period that uh, interest rates had become, um, had become benign in terms of their effect on the economy. Um, and we finally ended up at our, these are mortgage rates at those, these all time low rates there of 4.5% and that's the average rate. It wasn't a smooth journey. We can see there were some interest rate rises in 2016 and 2018. Well, that was the financial regulator that stepped in because they were a little concerned there were too many investors in the market at that stage. They were predicting interest rates would rise. Of course, they got that one wrong and so did the Reserve Bank, but, um, they had to risk manage the bank and they were worried too many investors if interest rates rose might cause some disruptions in our housing markets. And, uh, uh, and so they acted to quell demand by instructing banks to reduce lending to investors. However, the lesson was, was finally learned from the Reserve Bank that uh, nothing was happening with lower rates, that the economy wasn't recovering. So it went into the deep dive uh, and obviously reinforced through COVID to bring out official rates down to 0.1 of a percent, which is as close to zero as you can possibly get. And we're now in for a very lengthy period um, of low interest rates, which actually is a really good news story for the housing market, because we won't be exposed to those uh, ups and downs of changes in interest rates. We all know we don't want higher interest rates. It does make property less affordable, pushes prices down, 
uh, and particularly for investors, it's um, it's a big no-no. But the future now is for very low, record low interest rates for the foreseeable future. Reserve Bank says 2024, and they were saying that before COVID. So uh, the outlook certainly is uh, is one for low interest rates for quite some time. We had a conversation with uh, a number of those predicting around about six weeks ago that interest rates were going to rise next year. Of course, that's fallen off the cliff in terms of being a, uh, a prediction that was uh, relevant, uh, particularly given uh, COVID. But it was always uh, a prediction that was going to have to be changed because we are in this long-term environment where low interest rates will have to be uh, maintained because of um, particularly low incomes growth and low inflation. So that's the interest rate story, just quickly. Um, but of course, what we're interested in is house prices. And these are Canberra's house and unit prices. You can see quite clearly how um, house prices respond to changes in interest rates, um, higher interest rates, lower house prices, lower interest rates, higher house prices. And you can see how, um, how uh, houses and units move together. And they did move together in Canberra typically until 2015-16. And the offset to the growth that the house that houses were enjoying, uh, which really took off compared to units, was that we had more stock coming into the market. Of course, we know new units were being built at record levels in the Canberra market through that period. And of course, that's the old law of supply and demand, and that helped to keep prices growth um, not as strong as house, uh, as house price growth. That's prices growth for units. But once we started to absorb the um, uh, the new stock coming into the market, you can see that units have, have since then started to catch up and are now tracking similarly to, to house price growth. Um, again, because of higher numbers of properties available, particularly in the Canberra market, which has a, a chronic shortage of houses. Um, and I think that's the other point that we're seeing the revival in uh, being driven with units in Canberra is that too many people are being uh, priced out of houses in Canberra and are now more and more looking at the, uh, at the option of units. And um, we've actually seen a falling away of the very strong uh, unit development that we saw through 2015 to 2018-19 in unit development in Canberra. Um, and uh, of course, that means that there's uh, where now, which we'll look at later, really emerging into an undersupply of property in the Canberra market, which clearly it has anyway, when we look at other factors. So first lesson here, interest rates, uh, the roller coaster is over. The interest rate genie is back in the bottle for a long time, in my opinion. That's a good thing in terms of the housing market, because it will become about local factors that will move prices, uh, that will change prices such as uh, the nature of supply or the nature of migration, rather than being exposed to the changes in interest rates. But you can see how strong at the very end there that Canberra's over the last 12 months, just how strong both houses and unit growth, prices growth uh, has been. Uh, again, uh, driven initially by lower interest rates, but also now about those local factors, which we'll have a look at going forward. So interest rates, remain lower for longer, uh, no more cuts left, 0.1 of a percent, and no rises for years. You don't have to believe me. Uh, I just asked the Reserve Bank, they're still saying 2024, and that was prior to, uh, to COVID. And of course, uh, all those uh, looking for a bit of a cheap headline that predicted higher interest rates next year um, have changed their mind very, very quickly. Convenient, I guess, using um, the lockdown as an excuse. And of course, um, uh, we have had a remarkable recovery since uh, the end of lockdowns last year, the significant lockdowns. Look at that unemployment rate. Can you believe that? Our unemployment rate is now at a 10-year low at just 4.6%. It's pushing towards a percent lower than where we were when we entered into COVID. And this is a, an important point, I think, when we're looking at you know, the economy in terms of a factor for our housing markets, is that we're actually starting this lockdown period in a much stronger position than where we started a year ago or 18 months ago when we went into lockdown uh, for the first time. And we only peaked at 7.5%. And as Mark was saying, there was a lot of hysterical predictions regarding the outlook for our economy through lockdown and post lockdown, you know, 10%, 20% unemployment rate. Well, we only got to 7.5%. 
And now we're at a 10-year low, um, which is a really positive thing. And as I said, what it means is that we're coming into this lockdown period, uh, which, of course, with New South Wales being in a longer lockdown than last year, last autumn, will be more severe in terms of its economic impact. But we are starting from a, a very strong position in our labour market. Um, but despite all that, uh, all that jobs growth and that low unemployment, we've still got very low incomes growth. And there's no way knowing that um, we're going to even think about higher interest rates when we have incomes growth at near record levels. Of course, it has adjusted from the issues of last year with JobKeeper, of course, pushed wages down. Um, but even coming back now, um, we're still at a very low level. So we need to really get back to the sort of numbers we saw back in mining boom number two when we had wages growth at around 4% before we'd even think about, uh, the Reserve Bank would even think about uh, increasing interest rates. And of course, inflation has re uh, rebounded uh, as incomes have, uh, wages have, but it's still below, and this is underlying inflation, uh, below where it was pre prior to COVID. And, and there's a lot of adjustment going on here. That's why inflation has increased. But again, it's well below uh, where it was during the strong period of growth, uh, where we were raising interest rates back in 2010 and 11. If we put that together, we end up with real wages growth. Uh, and that tells the whole story that we're actually at a very, this is the difference between what you're earning and what you're paying. And we're just 1.1 of a percent on the latest data above the line. Now, if the, the last thing the Reserve Bank would want to do is to increase the costs to consumers and households by pushing up interest rates because then we would have real wages falling uh, below the line. And that would be the worst possible thing for an economy back into recovery mode post COVID. But you can see how strong real wages were growing nearly 2% back in the good old days when we were increasing interest rates. So look, this is all about really creating um, the clear argument that uh, interest rates are not the bogey they used to be. The outlook is completely different than it has been. And that uh, we need to look at local factors uh, and, uh, and, and really put to one side uh, issues of, yeah, but what happens if interest rates rise? Because uh, they aren't going anywhere anytime soon. In fact, I think we're further away. We're 10 years since the last interest rate increase, and I think we're further away now from the next one than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. So uh, our recession is over, growth revived. We've got COVID again. I'm not so sure we'll get a recession this time. It was a near uh, miss our recession last time. Uh, we have to have two consecutive quarters of negative growth to have a uh, to have a, um, a a recession, and uh, we only just had that down by 0.3 of a percent in the March quarter, and then a very sharp decline in the June quarter last year. We're talking about, but since then our economy has recovered. In fact, we had our GDP numbers out for June last week, and they were very very good numbers, 0.7 of a percent over the quarter, and you can see that 0.7% is higher than where we were tracking on average prior to COVID. So our economy is still kicking along quite strongly um, in recovery mode. Now, obviously, it's going to take a hit over the September quarter with lockdown, but um, you'll notice there isn't as many hysterical predictions of a recession this time in. It will depend on the December quarter uh, economic performance. Uh, I think we will go down in, de in September, but... Um, Fingers crossed we can get out of lockdown with those vaccination rates being high in the next month or two and we will avoid the recession. But nonetheless, as I mentioned before, um, we're in a very strong position at least to start um, the uh, adjustment uh, through lockdown to our economy. So let's have a look at the unemployment rates. And as usual, and we'll start to compare Canberra with everybody else here. Canberra has the lowest unemployment rate. But you know what's really interesting here? We're comparing July this year to July last year, and you can see it's not much different in Canberra. So really, Canberra didn't have the same knock-around effect that the other capital cities had as a result of COVID. And uh, it, it, it's lower, but it's not a lot lower than where it was. Again, not only is it the lowest unemployment rate, but it's the one that hasn't fallen, wasn't the highest or wasn't affected by COVID to the, to the, uh, the same degree as the other capital city markets. Also, Canberra has the highest percentage of the workforce in work, of the population in work, um, well above uh, just about everybody else, certainly well above uh, most except for, uh, for Brisbane and Perth there, but over 70% participation rate, 
very strong economy. Uh, and of course, Canberra has the highest wages of any of the states quite clearly. So a very strong economy, a resilient economy, and um, obviously an economy where wages are higher than anybody else. Um, we'll just look generally, just to keep reinforcing the strength of our local economy. Retail sales have been a big driver of our revival, you know, online sales, um, decking out the home office. You just have to look at the profits that JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman have made as part of that online retail uh, boom. Uh, retail sales have dipped a bit over the last two months, but they're still above where they were prior to COVID. Uh, our share market is uh, continuing to have a very steady improvement, which is uh, a positive reinforcement of uh, sentiment from local investors, where we certainly haven't had the dip that we had in lockdown uh, in March last year, and we are consistently higher now than where we were at our peak prior to COVID, uh, and we are at all-time high now. And the stock market has actually been quite um, encouraging, given that we have gone into shutdown and it really hasn't had that sort of dip. So more positive news on the, I guess, the mindset of the economy. And the Australian dollar, it dipped a bit over the last couple of months, but it's starting to come back. No surprise, it dipped. We actually had a weaker period for our iron ore through that period. Also, of course, there was concern from international investors uh, regarding the New South Wales lockdown. And also the American dollar was strong through that period as well with some positive economic news. But we are starting to recover now with our, uh, with our dollar. And I think that's the realisation that um, part of that is the realisation that we've got our, uh, our COVID issues seemingly under control uh, and that our prospects going forward are looking a lot brighter. So again, reinforcing the positives of the Australian economy. And this is through the perceptions of the international community, international investors uh, of our economy. And of course, that means COVID prospects. So let's have a look at Canberra. I regard it as the premium investment market. And we start, of course, with home prices. Look at this growth here in Canberra's uh, house prices, uh, certainly challenging Sydney in terms of the strongest market in the country. We can see, as I mentioned, units aren't growing quite as quickly and they don't in any of the capital city markets because it's a, there's a, you know, it doesn't have the same level of demand that houses have. Um, but certainly still very strong growth, nearly 10% growth in Canberra unit prices over the past year. And interestingly enough, Canberra house and unit prices have increased faster than any other capital city, including Sydney, over the past five years. So um, certainly the first tick of the box for the Canberra market on prices. Um, we can see there that uh, uh, over the past year, the growth for Canberra is second only to Sydney, up by 18.8% compared to Sydney 24%, which has been uh, a market in catch-up mode, Sydney. Mm. I understand that the Sydney market, even though it's had these spectacular results over the last year, has still only averaged around 4% uh, per year since 2017. So it's really catching up, Sydney. Uh, and Canberra certainly not in that same catch-up mode. It's just growing because of, its, uh, um, because of high demand over supply. So Canberra number two there in terms of annual price growth. Um, I think this is interesting when we look at comparing median, current median house prices, uh, you can see Sydney clearly the most expensive there, but um, Canberra certainly is number two in mm. terms of median house price. But I, I want you to notice something that's very important here, and that's the gap between Canberra's median unit price and Sydney's, and uh, sorry, Canberra's median house price. You can see how it has the biggest gap between the two. So what that tells you is that, and that's why, of course, we have higher yields in Canberra, one of the factors, but it, um, it also shows the, uh, I guess, the opportunity um, perception, not perception, but reality of Canberra units versus what you pay for Canberra houses. So the difference between the two, the Canberra has a higher difference between what you pay for a house and what you pay for a unit are quite clearly compared to most of the other capitals except for Adelaide. And I think that again reinforces the value of the unit market in Canberra when you compare that to what you pay for a house uh, in Canberra. And I think that only means that as uh, being the second most expensive housing market in the country, a capital city market, that um, you know obviously when people are priced out of the house market, they will start to increasingly look at uh, at the unit market as an option. Uh, let's have a look at buyer types now. So prices certainly some big ticks there for Canberra for both houses and units. 
Um, we can see our housing loans are still booming, came off the boil a little bit uh, over July, the latest data. Uh, owner occupiers at the top, but still very much in record territory, owner occupier lending. Uh, the black line there are investors. You can see our investor activity was impacted from 2015 with that credit squeeze that was taking investors out of the market. Mm. Started to rebound last year as prices grew. Investors are very strong at the moment. Um, the, the reverse of that, the grey at the bottom, are owner, uh, first home buyers. And of course, high prices are squeezing first home buyers out of the market. They can't save at the same rate as prices are growing. And of course, they don't have a trade-in to take advantage of higher prices as owner occupiers do. So no surprise that first home buyer numbers are falling sharply as prices have risen uh, steeply. And, uh, and the other thing is, of course, they're competing against investors as well. But investors are back in town and growing strongly, no surprise about that. But there's still plenty of upside uh, to get back to those levels, uh, investor levels um, during previous cycles. Uh, we can see investor lending here, um, uh, is, it has, has continued to grow nationally, uh, and that's the highest we've seen since 2017 and well above a year ago, national investor lending. Um, and you can still see there the national investor market share is still below uh, the long-term average. Again, this is just reinforcing the opportunities for investors going forward. And we don't have to sort of look at that data because we know that there's a very strong appetite for investors in, uh, in our housing markets at the moment, coming from that low base, but catching up quite quickly. And you can see there that uh, first-home buyer is still above long-term average, first-home buyer numbers, but it's getting quite close to it now. Canberra investors, same as the national market. You can see how Canberra investors have grown quite strongly. That underlying trend is now nearly three times more uh, lending going on in the Canberra investor market compared to where it was a year ago, similar to other markets. First home buyers are still quite reasonable in Canberra, but you can see the trend is starting to move downwards as with the nationals. Um, and again, when we look at the market share for Canberra, it's similar to what we can see on the national market share uh, with investors still below the long-term average and uh, first home buyers still above the long-term average, but that gap is narrowing in both instances. Uh, we spoke about building um, in Canberra and we can, look at the, um, we can look at the underlying trend of building. I mentioned how strong that market was and these are building approvals. Um, uh, in Canberra for for uh, for units, you can see units there are the grey uh, the grey chart in the middle. But you can see how that's flattened off since that very big boom period from 2016 to 19. But overall, the the orange at the top is total homes built. Can you see how total homes are just really flatlining at the moment? And this is only going to reinforce the clear shortage of housing that there is in the Canberra market, both houses and units. Um, and this, of course, is going to ensure that prices will continue to rise and rents will continue to rise, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, with the rental markets, uh, Canberra's rents are still clearly the highest of all the capital city markets, uh, higher even than Sydney. Uh, and we're seeing very strong growth in Canberra rents over the past year, annual growth there. And that's quite spectacular for houses of uh, over 12% and unit growth of nearly 15% rental growth in unit. And the reason we have that, of course, is very, very low vacancy rates in the capital market, um, mm. just 7 of a percent for houses and 1% for, um, for units. And when we put that together, it's the lowest vacancy rate of any of the capital city markets. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because that's been traditionally Canberra's issue has been a shortage of property. And I guess if you're an investor or a landlord, what you want is plenty of competition for your product because it ensures, and that's why we have high rents in Canberra, because you know tenants have to pay higher to secure a property. And in a, uh, a an economy, which we saw before, which has the highest incomes clearly of any of the capital cities, it means that um, you know uh, tenants can pay a higher rent uh, in, uh, in, 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 as, a, as a reflection of that competition. So another big tick for the Canberra market in terms of uh, overall, in terms of the rental market, 
um, skyrocketing rents and just about uh, you know no vacant properties, both units and houses. And when we talk about, of course, investment, we are talking about not just capital growth, but also um, yields. And yields are becoming more important for investors, I believe, particularly in this low income, low return economy, low uh, interest rate economy. And we can see as these are borrowers' rates, not lenders' rates. So as um, your interest rate when you've on your mortgage has fallen sharply over the last 10 years, you've also seen what you're getting with your deposit in the bank for. It's just 0.25 of a percent if you've got a, um, a term deposit of $10,000 that you lock away for a year. All you get is 0.25 of a percent. And of mm. course, you've got to pay tax on that. Um, and uh, you compare that to gross yields for units, uh, and there's a huge gap between the two of them. Uh, now, a record gap between, I guess, a similar investment uh, vehicle, and that's um, a property investment. You can see Canberra well and truly has the highest yields. Uh, yields have come down in Canberra recently, even though we're seeing strong rents growth because we're seeing strong prices growth. So that's acting to push rents down, which is making you know, apartment owners pretty happy, let me tell you. Uh, and we've seen similarly in Melbourne and Sydney, which are the bottom two there for yield. Uh, the reason their um, yields are lower is because they have had strong prices growth also. Uh, also recently, particularly uh, the Sydney market. So another tick for uh, for the Canberra market, it has the highest yields and you can see there when we compare them. And I do think that one of the factors that's keeping that yield high is considering that we have uh, virtually no vacant um, apartments at all for rent. And also that we have that gap between the price of a unit and the price of a house is that it's undervalued. And I think that's clearly an undervalued asset. And I think the yield might start to ease, but that'll be because prices will be growing, continue to grow strongly. Particularly, as I said, we can see that undersupply of, uh, of new apartments coming into the market and, and new houses coming into the market in Canberra. And if we put it all together, annual returns and, uh, and yields, it gives us our total return on investment. We can see the Canberra market sitting there up at the top again for total returns. So that's capital growth over a year with the uh, with the annual yield as well. Uh, and interestingly, when we look at the long-term average for total returns uh, for Canberra units, uh, and as we said, we're up there at 14.9.3% at the, in the current quarter, and the average, um, the long-term average there is 8.5. So uh, we're well at, uh, above that long-term average yield. And as I said, I think we're, we're looking for some uh, higher than average capital growth, uh, given the particularly the interest in investors in that market at the moment. So just a quick update to finish off the latest data. Let's have a look at the latest prices. This is um, the prices over the last three months since that June quarter data that we were using before. You can see, interestingly enough, the prices growth is starting to ease. And that was prior to COVID. Now, the reason it is is because they're crazy numbers for monthly house price growth. And of course, we are starting to get affordability issues as the cycle matures. That is, people just can't keep paying 3% extra per month for properties. They can't get the extra money from the bank to do that because we know interest rates are flat and incomes growth is flat. So we are coming, and of course, you know, in the Sydney market, as an example, we're coming off growth rates of 25% per year. So of course, this is not sustainable and we're starting to see that easing prior to COVID. But even when we look at the um, when we look at the uh, positions over August, this is still very very strong prices growth, um, nonetheless. But it's not the really unsustainable prices growth that we had over June. But interestingly enough, another tick for the Canberra box, it too has fallen away uh, in August compared to July. But it now has the strongest growth rate of any of the capitals um, in August. So it's come down but it's now the top performing capital city for prices growth uh, for houses. So again, reinforcing um, just how strong that Canberra market is. Let's have a look at something a bit more recent, our auction markets, uh, Canberra auction markets still producing these remarkable clearance rates down a little bit from those 90% rates we were getting in April and May, but just under 90% now um, uh, clearance rates. 
we can see there when we compare to uh, our other capital city markets that it's uh, tracking similar to Adelaide and well ahead of Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane in terms of clearance rates. These are the August clearance rates for the regions in Canberra. It shows Gungahal and the, um, uh, the top performer there in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, clearance rates, but all quite strong. Um, and this is last Saturday's results. Obviously, we're starting to see some impact from the uh, lockdown in Canberra. Um, there was a sharp decline in the number of properties auctioned last week, um, down uh, around about a quarter, and the clearance rate also fell down as well. Uh, still strong, but um, certainly not at the levels we've been used to. But of course, this is uh, what we expect from, um, from the lockdown environment. And we do know, as I said originally, that uh, all this acts is as an impediment to buying and selling. And once those impediments are released, those lost opportunities are very quickly uh, made up. So just summarising um, to finish up, prices boom for houses and units is on hold, as I just said, as lockdown impacts the market for now. Record local start to the year was a record start for Canberra. Prices increasing uh, faster than any other capital city over the past five years. Strongest capital city auction market with record clearance rates uh, over the year. And investors are certainly returning to the market. The medium term outlook is for steadier, more reliable prices growth with no prospect of higher rates in the foreseeable future. And that's a really good thing. Uh, it has Canberra has the highest capital city yields, in, indicates, in my opinion, an undervalued asset. Uh, rents are rising extraordinarily sharply uh, because of those tight vacancy rates, which are the lowest of all the capitals. And of course, we know there remain significant tax advantages for residential property, uh, as well as those income benefits uh, through capital growth. Sharp fall in new building over recent years in Canberra will only reinforce what is clearly an undersupplied market uh, as reflected in those high and uh, sharply growing rents and prices. Uh, and housing shortages will emerge, particularly once we get uh, those borders opened up again. Canberra will continue to embrace uh, apartment living as affordable, uh, convenient and a livable alternative, and particularly an affordable alternative when you look at the high price of housing. And I think that's what's happening in Canberra. There really is a cultural shift now towards apartment living. Uh, and I think that's not just about affordability, it's also about the convenience and livability uh, of apartments as, as, a, uh, as an alternative lifestyle. Uh, strong capital, uh, the strongest capital city economy, of course, will continue to drive the local housing market. So these are my forecasts for the year. Uh, even with COVID, I think uh, Canberra will remain top of the pops there at around about 20%. We need to see how much the, the lockdown will uh, last, how long it will last, and how those vaccination rates can uh, act to ease the restrictions but also uh, I'm uh, predicting a 10% for uh, increase this year in Canberra unit prices as well. So there's our beginning picture, the great, uh, our great uh, Parliament House, our national capital. And of course, uh, it's also the national capital uh, in terms of being uh, a leading investment market. And those numbers were quite clear um, that I presented today. It ticks the boxes on just about every leading indicator and also performance indicator um, uh, for an investor market and, and for an owner-occupier market too there. But certainly it's, uh, and, and when you consider its entry level is, is quite low compared to what you pay for similar investment properties in Sydney. And of course it is only, you know, an hour, an hour and a half drive, well, maybe three hours drive from Sydney, depends what you're driving. Um, it has all the advantages of proximity as well as those advantages of, uh, of uh, being a, a primary investment asset. So that's me, I'm finished. There's my brand um, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, we time. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> Re look, we're really, we're really good on time, I think. Um, th th that was awesome. Look, there's a lot of information that we've got there. And just to summarise, I picked out a few key points that you put first of all uh what are people waiting for because the signs are there whether we're talking about canberra we're talking about everything um with the market in australia as a whole um it is outperforming what uh the uh what people initially predicted um interest rates are going to stay as they are we don't expect rises till 
2024 or, or beyond? Um, potentially, maybe, do you reckon there'll, there'll be some going lower? Well, it's, what, what we've seen, it's been a little bit of, um, you know, I didn't want to put the question out, has anybody locked in a rate over the last month or two? Because, you know, we, we did have a big marketing campaign that was sort of promoting the fact that it was a good time to lock in a fixed rate, mm. um, a fixed term rate. Um, I was a little horrified at that. I think it was an attempt to, you know, to try to, um, you know, it was a marketing campaign and, and there was a lot of discussion around those marketing campaigns, particularly from a couple of the banks that they felt that interest rates were going to rise. And I think that really was a hook to people to lock in a, a fixed term rate. Um, but of course, since then, we've had the, the COVID come and there's just no prospect of, uh, of higher rates. In fact, the, the underlying data even before COVID was, was quite sobering when we look at incomes growth and real wages growth is very, very low. And the last thing the, uh, uh, the Reserve Bank would want to do was to crush any sense of um, consumer activity by making, you know, the, making your, your, your budget, your bottom line even worse. Um, and I think that, that we would have had a, a shelving of those predictions sooner rather than later, even without COVID. But the last thing we, we need going forward now is higher interest rates. Um, but the Reserve Bank would only do that if we had not just a breakout in inflation. So it's just not always about inflation. We've got to forget inflation because we could have high inflation and low wages growth. And that would be a nightmare for the Reserve Bank because it would mean real wages are falling. We have to have them both together. We have to have high wages, uh, wages growth and inflation working together at the same time the Reserve Bank to even consider higher interest rates as it did, as it was back in 2011 when it last raised rates. But I think this is a good thing, but it doesn't matter how much you say it, people still are wary of interest rates rising, even though we are so far away from an interest rate increase on the science than we've ever been before. There's just no argument for it at all, other than trying to get a cheap headline, which the higher interest rate news headline is always a cheap headline, right? Um, and we haven't had an interest rate increase for 11 years. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's a long, long, long time ago. What were you doing 11 years ago, Mark? I'll be sucking my thumb somewhere. But um, look, <laughs> I wanted to bring up a, another point uh, that you, you mentioned. Um, really interesting, you mentioned the, the price gap between um, houses and yeah. unit particularly for the Canberra market. I'm asking um, Simon just to unmute himself <laughs> at the moment. I did a bit of research, uh, you know, it happens once in a while, and um, it recorded uh, over the last three years the highest gap in all-time Australian property market history, 74.6% gap. Um, and you showed that, that, okay, that gap is starting to close. Um, I think your, the numbers there were around the 50% mark now. Um, could I hear from Simon, in, what does that mean in terms of, of dollar figures? Uh, Dr. Wilson was mentioning that Gungalan was a high, the highest performer for the Canberra market, but other areas, I know that uh, you're based in Belconnen, which is also quite a popular location for investment. What sort of figures are we looking at comparing houses to apartments? Yeah, well, I mean, I can give you my <clears throat> sort of specific example. I'm... I'm, I'm born and bred in Belconnen. So I live in a suburb that's sort of 10 minutes or eight minutes further south of the, or north of the city than uh, west of the city than what um, the, our Belconnen precinct is, where we've got High Society and Republic, a big, big precinct that um, many of you would be familiar with. And, you know, the median uh, house price in, in my suburb has gone from, you know, in the past two years around that 700,000 to about that 1.5, 1.6 million with, with um, you know, three sales over 2 million in the last six months. But yet my wife and I have an investment property in high society, two bed, uh, two bath. I think I've given this example before that we bought for 399. Um, but then it's getting, you know, that 540 a week rent and it's closer to the city opposite a university. So, you know, the gaps are pretty, pretty significant, um, particularly in my, in my area. So, you know, and, and one of the things that, that I've noticed um, probably in the last couple of weeks, and it, it sort of echoes Dr. Andrew Wilson's point, and this isn't just a jerk on perspective, but a, a Canberra pers perspective is that undervalued unit market. And I think one of the big drivers over the next coming years is going to be the cost to build. 
um, we're starting to price yes. up. We're starting to price up um, future projects. We've got a large pipeline, and and the cost to build is going to increase significantly in the next yeah in the coming years, and that's not, that's just automatically going to drive up these unit prices because you know it's 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 the most significant increases that we've certainly seen. I've been at Jerkon four years, but we've been in existence for nearly twenty, and uh, our owner is just saying that the, the cost to build the, these things is the you know it's growing at a at a, at a faster rate than it ever has. So therefore in two years time, when we're bringing you know, more and more projects to the market to deal with the demand, um, it's gonna drive up the existing prices given the, the costs, the costs in timber, the costs in steel, the costs in resources. And I'd be interested to hear your views on that, Andrew, because that's something that's really stood out to me in the last couple of weeks. I was actually gonna mention this to you, Simon. I was actually gonna get in touch with you. We're, we're doing a, a thing this week on, I've got a, a building cost index, a national building costs index, uh, and that's home building cost index that I'm gonna run for apartments, townhouses, and houses individually. Um, and it's really gone through the roof. And I do a lot of presentations, uh, you know, almost daily presentations. And a number of the Q and A's I'm getting from tradesmen are telling me that uh, they, they're just, uh, really squeezed for supplies, materials, you know, uh, the whole gamut. Of course, this is a reflection on um, the Home Builder Initiative. But, um, yeah, this will be out in the national media in the next week or two. We might even get Geocon to have a bit of a chat about that one. But um, there's no doubt that this is a, a – we always see that when we bring forward demand and you haven't got the supply to match it, um, you know, you, you get these constraints, of, of which means costs have to rise. And I'm not sure what happens with a lot of those that have um, purchased on fixed term contracts, you know, because the poor old builder can't absorb it for, for forever. They have to eventually start putting up prices, uh, you know, because costs are, are just skyrocketing. And of course, that just adds another layer to markets such as the Canberra market, which has strong underlying demand anyway. And the point of that is that we've clearly uh, illustrated the difference between what you pay for a house and what you pay for a um, for a unit. I think that's the, the the what you were talking about, Mark. Is it's actually the lower the 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 ratio, the mm. the more affordable the unit is. So you're only paying around half for a typical unit than you pay for a typical house. So that that's shows amazing. you it's you know a, a tremendous discount for unit living compared to house living in Canberra. So there's plenty of upside there, particularly in an environment where you have such strong incomes growth such a very strong economy um, that will eventually push up, you know, prices because they'll have to go up because of the cost of building a new one, you know. Mm. True. Absolutely. Like we, we've got a pro, we, we've got a prime example now, and we, we, we're fortunate that we can. You know, we're about to call for for settlements of uh, a project in the CBD Metropole, uh, which which we took to market three years ago, and we lock all our costs in at the start of the project. So, um, people that have bought in there have done quite well, but we're doing the feasibility for our, our next CBD release. You know, two hundred meters away, and that's where it becomes, you know, costing it out and locking them is where you really notice that increase in. In build costs. So everyone that's bought in, in Metropole at say 8,000, 9,000 a square metre, just naturally the, the cost of build is going to push that up to 10 and a half, 11 from no other factors other than the cost of building 200 metres down the road. Yeah, look, it's just another box that's ticked, you know, that just adds to the, you know, the value of um, Canberra apartments. And as I said, I'm not, I'm not spruiking Canberra apartments. I'm just looking at the numbers. And the numbers are, are just irrefutable. And, and they have been for quite some time. Um, but, uh, you, you know, if anything, it, it's becoming, with the cost issue, it's becoming even more of a, of a, of a market that's uh, getting tougher for buyers to get into, you know. Um, but as I said, but as I said, I, I think the fact is that of all the markets, it has the highest incomes and the strongest economy. So at least it has the capacity to be able to pay up um, for higher for higher prices, but again, if you're an investor and you're not necessarily worried about that, it also has the support from you know really crazy incomes growth, uh, rental growth over the last year to be able to maintain a very good return on investment. You know to support um, you know prices coming through, but of course you know I guess the whole point is that um, um, those costs that are coming through the system now 
are only going to push up the price of units coming into the market um, in you know over the next six to twelve months. You know, and and as I said, with investors certainly looking for very uh, you know becoming even more tuned into bricks and mortar investments. Um, and we can see that with the surge in investor activity right across the country at the moment, um, that, uh, you know, opportunities like this will not last, I believe. Absolutely. Look, Dr. Wilson, I just have to ask you, um, are you okay to hang around for another 15 minutes? Yeah, of course. Fantastic. Uh, we've got a question that's in the chat at the moment. I'll ask uh, Guy Michelle, are you able to, uh, would you like to read out the question yourself or would you like to me to read that one out for you? Where is he? He's in, I think he's still in the, the room. Uh, okay. Okay. Can't seem to find him. There's a fair few people in here. His question is this, Dr. Wilson. I think this is aimed uh, for you. Comment on the restrictive rental controls that do not allow investors to change rent to keep pace with the market. Well, where, where are those restrictions? Yeah, I mean, that's probably one I can answer. So okay. that, 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 that is something that, um, that, that the ACT government has looked at um, and has, has um, introduced in terms of um, uh, CPI growth and certain restrictions. In saying that, um, because of um, bringing in different um, uh, players like build, the build to rent um, sector, it's, some, it's a policy that's currently under review. Um, the, the 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 ability they're, they're just basically trying to make it harder to kick people out and increase the rents uh, at a at a crazy rate but you're still able to increase it at the end of the term in line with cpi or other things but in, in saying that it's something that is un, by by bringing this in they've actually prevented build to rent players coming into town and that's something that they desperately uh, need so it's a it's a bit of a watch this space at the moment. It's not something that's affected um, certainly myself as as a as an as investor in the Canberra market uh, yet. But if it does see itself out, it will have a it will have an impact uh, down the track. But um, I, I don't see it having a long term impact given that they are desperately trying to attract build to rent players into into the market. Yeah, and I think that um, we've seen. Canberra rents have increased for units by 15% over the last year, which is the strongest growth of any of the capital city markets. It has the highest rents in the country. And once you start um, playing around with rent control, like you said, Simon, all you do is curtail the supply side. And they've got to understand that, you know, they can't be too clever on the supply side because they'll end up with this mishmash of conflicting policy positions. It's really about there's too many people and not enough houses. They've just got to build more housing. They've got to allow more housing to be built to match demand, particularly given that, you know, the more supply you have, the more competition you have amongst suppliers for that reduced pool of tenants. Um, you're not going to, you know, you won't, uh, it won't work. Rent control will not work. And they'll only become uh, even more constrained in terms of um, providing new supply into Canberra. But of course, you know it's uh, it's that sort of anti-free market, you know, position, and that Canberra is, you know, I understand that they restrict land supply as a, as more or less a cultural thing in Canberra, but that's why you've got the highest rents in the country, and that's why you've got the second highest house prices in the country, uh, and it's a small community when we compare it to Melbourne and Sydney. Um, you know, it just doesn't have the balance between efficient supply and what is strong demand. And that can take a long time to get it right. The point is, if you get it wrong, it stays wrong for a long time. And that's the point. You, it's very difficult to get out of that. Um, and governments can come and go, but people need to have efficient housing communities for their life, for their lifetimes, you know, um, and, that, and that's, a, that's a really big issue. But supply, in my opinion, is the, is the answer, not trying to control um, you know, control rents, like, mm. you know, that, that, that would only, and perhaps build to rent is one of the most uh, fertile, Canberra is one of the most fertile grounds for build to rent, really, because Absolutely. of significant barriers to getting into the housing market. I'm not a big mm. rap for build to rent, but if Canberra likes that type of a government 
corporate relationship, which it is. It's in my opinion, it's public housing by another name. But if they like that sort of relationship, um, you know, good on them, and that would probably suit their agenda more than trying to control the market, which they won't do. Mm. And just just to close out, I guess I would sort of reiterate your point around the the vacancy rates, and, and this sort of ties back into the to the rents. Is one of the one of the scariest things um, in terms of the the vacancy rates in Canberra is outside of government. Our next biggest sector is education. There's seventy thousand students in Canberra. 20,000 international, and we're not even back open yet. Yes, that's right. It, mm. it, if, if the borders were, were, were open, then, so, that, yeah, but, I mean, with with literally, you know, in a, in a place like, um, yeah. you know, Bell Conan with, with all these international um, uh, students, uh, you know, the best part of 8,000 that are still overseas, there'd be, there'd be people um, well, in, in the park. Yeah. yeah. It'd be looking like San Francisco. And uh, or LA, and that would really give those pollies a nightmare. Because if you haven't got enough houses, you haven't got enough houses. You got to, you know, you buy a tent. Absolutely. Look, guys, I do have another question here from um, Xiao Liang, and she's asked me to, or he has asked me to read this out. Uh, given the reduced export, inflation, job seeking, or keeping support from the, the government. For how long will you predict these price increasing? Well, well, house prices, as I said, the cycle has started to mature naturally, if I could sort of say that. And that's because um, we don't have the incomes growth. It's very simple, the housing market. You can buy more for a property, right, up until you pay 30% of your income or 25% of your income in a loan. Once you... Can't, once you start to want to pay more than 25% of your income, the bank will say, go away, all right? Because we don't do that uh, because we still have quite strict lending regulations. So the only way you can increase the proportion, well, you can't increase the proportion. So the only way you will make be able to pay higher prices is if you get a big wage rise or you get a big interest rate cut. Both of them ain't just going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Not certainly in an aggregated sense. So it means that eventually the market price growth, which is all catch-up price growth at the moment, and, you know, catching up with all those interruptions that we've had, the minute you reach that ceiling, and I have an affordability index which clearly predicts it, and we're seeing it now, you just can't afford to pay any more. So mm -hmm. this massive boom we've had just runs out of steam because, A, people have bought, that's it. They've bought their house. They've made up for what they haven't done over the last couple of years because they couldn't, either in shutdown or whatever. Um, and they can't keep trading in properties because of um, their restrictions, because of low incomes growth and interest rates being flat. Um, the only offset to that are investors and investors are on the rise and they will impact some markets. Uh, with higher price growth, but they will be the high yielding uh, markets, which are typically low entry points, such mm. as apartments or out of suburban properties. Um, but we're only talking 30% of the market anyway, in terms of investors. And it's the 60% of the market that are, or 50 to 60% of the market that are owner occupiers that are being squeezed out now because they just can't afford to pay more, right? So this is a, just a natural easing of the cycle and it's something that's you know a very positive uh prospect a good thing because you know we'll then be able to move into a much more uh steady and reliable and predictable uh environment so we don't have to worry about interest rates uh prices are start we saw that on that latest data the prices are easing in every capital city market they're still really strong right but they're not crazy because they were crazy a couple of months ago and that's just because affordability is starting to tack its way into creating the, the, the barriers to keeping pushing prices up. Turnover is still pretty good, um, but the prices growth, you know, isn't what it was. But what it was, was just not sustainable. And it mm. was, as I said, all that catch up stuff. So we don't need to look at extraneous factors in terms of the impact on house price growth, uh, because it is all about interest rates. And as long as we can say that interest rates are going to be flat for the foreseeable future, 
we know it is all about local supply and demand factors going forward. Absolutely. Look, we've got another question there because um, it, it does appear to be, as you're showing, quite an investor field market. Uh, we've got an investor with us today. His name is Max Steiner. He's got a question specifically uh, about investment in a particular area. You there, Max? Yeah, can you jump in? Yeah, go for it, mate. Yeah, hi, I'm Max. How are you? Hi, Max. I might put a picture to it if I can get that going. That's right. But um, yeah, we're we're interested in Canberra. We've been looking at the area for quite a few months. But um, what we're looking at is more established areas like um, you know around your Griffith or, or Kingston or Forest. But we've sort of started looking at Yarra. Yarramunda. So kind of want to get your feedback on, on that, what you think of Yarramunda rather than your, your sort of news in Belconnen and Gongarlan. So, so what's, your, what's your aim, Max? What are you looking for in terms of an investment property? Is it, you know, you obviously have a, a, a preference based on factors other than um, financial factors? Or... Well, like looking at the, the market in there, like... Um, my son lives down there currently, and I've also got other family down there. So we, we do like Canberra for a lot of reasons. But he lives in Kingston. So we've been looking around that Kingston area for quite a while. And then we, we stumbled across Yarrambunda one day. And, and to me, it was like, well, this is a bit of an untapped area. And it could be, in a way, one of the next suburbs to, to go. So that's that's one of the reasons. It's still very affordable. Like when you talk about affordable units, you you're looking at um, still around the four hundred thousand dollar mark for two two bedroom units down there, yeah. and the the rental rental return is still very good. So they're they're cash flow positive as well. So yeah, look, uh, I, I think the first we've also got another criteria with us as well is. We're looking at some of the older units. We don't mind getting getting in there and um, sort of getting a bit of a fixer upper, sort of giving us room to move and put our own work into it and, and sort of make it into a better investment. Yeah, well, look, I, I think really you're sort of moving away from the sort of the strength of the underlying financials of the proposition to something where there has some personal connection to you, right? Yeah. And that might be areas where obviously you have a family connection, areas that you actually like, um, and, you know, sort of appealing to your sense of wanting to, you know, do a, a flip of some sort, right? Um, but from the perspective of the next place to go, which you, which you mentioned, Max, um, I, I think that one of the things we've sort of got to move away from is the notion of the hotspot. Um, a lot of that was driven by... I guess the waves of the interest rates and a particular <laughs> demographic being strong in the market through that interest rate change period. But I think going forward, we're going to have a much flatter cycle. So looking for the prospect of strong or, or clearly above average capital growth uh, generally in an area is not going to be as, particularly in Canberra, which is, which is really consolidating its, I guess, urban profile, it is going to be a much more difficult task. I think you've just got to, you know, property investment for mine is always about that medium to long-term view. And in the first instance, you just buy something that obviously looks at the, the math strongly, and that's high yields, low vacancy rate, and low entry point, right? Um, mm. And then you, you sort of move on from that and build your portfolio, rather than it being a sort of a cottage focus um, scenario, you know? Mm. But uh, having said that, everybody's different. And if you are looking at those particular you know, things that are positive for you, then, then good on you. And I think that the whole point to the exercise is that the Canberra market as a consolidated market is an undersupplied market. You know, it doesn't matter where you're looking to rent, you're not going to find anything. And uh, what you're looking to buy, you're going to probably be paying, you know, more for it next month than you will this month, you know. Mm. And, uh, that's the point. But if you have particular preferences, then it's just a matter of looking to find what you're, what you're after. But if you're, a, I guess, more of a, you know, looking just for the bottom line, um, then that you should move away from those sort of subjective factors that you were talking about. But at the end of the day, you know, if that's what 
um, is, is part of your uh, sense of being an investor, well, good luck to you. Okay. Yeah, sure. And your feel for the suburb in the area, like the south, southwest. We're going to have to, we're gonna have to cut you short on that north, one, northwest. Sorry? I, I might have to cut you short on that one because we are drawing uh, to the end. Look, um, I've got your question. We're going to get back to you on that one. So um, oh. I hope that does answer your the first part yep. of your question. Yeah, it's very good. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Thank you, Max. We'll get in touch anyway. But mm -hmm. um, look, Dr. Andrew Wilson, Simon, everyone that's in here today, um, there's a couple of things that I, I would like to uh, do before we do end. Um, and the first thing is for everyone to unmute themselves. So I've, I've just requested everyone to unmute. And can on uh, Dr. Wilson's request, can we all turn our cameras on, please? It's very rare that uh, he gets to, you know, see these so many faces. And uh, when he's walking in the streets around Sydney, or maybe one day in Canberra, if he sees times. your face, he knows where to run the other yeah. direction. <laughs> yeah, good one, mate. All right, so I might just take a quick picture, guys, just to um, document for today. So I'll take a screenshot. So one, two, three, smile. Okay, I can't get it open. Well, we'll do one more. Okay, so one, two, three. Smile. Big smile. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. All right, guys. And the second thing is, uh, first of all, I appreciate everyone staying till the end. We've had quite a, a respectful and wonderful audience tonight. Uh, let's all congratulate and let Dr. Andrew Wilson, Simon Chester, hear our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for tonight. Okay, and lastly, as promised, for those of you that would like to receive the material and the content from tonight, please take note, and I'm going to put this into the chat uh, shortly, um, you can take a text message of 0423-237-112 asking for the content or to book in a time with one of our property specialists. So perhaps uh, that's yourself, uh, Max, let's book some time to have a chat. Um, or you can email us on support s u -P -P -O -R -T at cubecorp.com um, or you can like and comment on our Facebook post which I will keep that up for the next 24 hours um, and we can send that material out to you over the next 48 hours so thank you everyone again and thank you Dr. Wilson, Mr. Simon Chester for supporting tonight's market updates and a very positive outlook and uh, I'm going to steal your words Dr. Wilson Yes. Guys that are investing or looking to invest, what are you waiting for? <laughs> sure it's made of that. Say it all the time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Price growth last year. See you later, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So I'll just end the recording.